I started preparing this message a few weeks ago. I, I continue in my, my daily Bible studies. I would get into, and as I was talking about before, about writing notes. I need to start writing notes on pastor's messages. I need to start having notes, go back and study them, go on word studies and things like that to grow. I have not done that. I have not instituted, but I have instituted my morning time to where I get quiet before the Lord and I pray, but then I read and I read my devotionals. And, and if I'm struck by something or a thought comes to my head, I even have a book now that I take with me. I take with me to work. I, I, uh, and I write down any thought that I've got and I'll write down that thought so I don't forget it. So when I get my quiet time, I can sit down and I can dig through the word and I can you know, grow and I can glean from his word and he can speak to me. But not only that, it says to always be ready, always to be ready to give a, an answer of the hope that is in you to anybody who's around you. Because there's many people came in, come into my work and the work I do. And even a gentleman today, he came in and he was very sorrowful, but I could minister unto him because I had prepared my vessel. I prepared my vessel. My vessel was ready. My vessel was full so I could pour into him. So the title of my message tonight is The Crisis of an Empty Vessel. The Crisis of an Empty Vessel. I'm going to start off uh, my scriptures in 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 10 through 16. It's a very common passage. Uh, many people have taught on it is about Elijah and uh, I mean, uh, not Elijah, but Elisha and how he caused a drought to come and him and the you know, reaction that he had with the Shunammite woman. So 1 Kings 17 verses 10 through 16. So he arose and went to Zarephath and when he, when he came to the gate of the city. Indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first, and bring it to me, and afterward make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many bins. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Elijah. So when we go to verse 9 here, he says, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So, right before this, it talks about Elijah prayed and prayed that it wouldn't rain, that there was going to be drought. He says, go there, there's going to be a widow there waiting for you. I've spoke to her, and she's going to provide for you. And then you read a little bit later on, it, it doesn't look like she knew anything about any of it was happening. See, she was just going about her daily chores, going about her daily things, gathering and to be able to provide for her family. And she's looking, she knows drought is in the land. She sees it everywhere. And so she goes and she looks at her two jars and her, her jars are almost empty. So the crisis of an empty vessel. What are we going to do with that crisis? You see, she, she had no more hope. She had given up. She was just going about her daily chores, her daily things, going about... You know, basically punching the clock, going in, punching the clock, working her however many hours to keep her house clean and to make sure that her child was provided for. And she got to the point where it, it's hopeless. It's hopeless anymore. She forgot the God of hope. And so because she, her vessel was empty, she was not ready to receive from the Lord. 
So she didn't hear. God may have been speaking to her, but because her vessels were empty, she wasn't able to hear from him and to know that her hope was coming. See, she could have had hope because he said, I went ahead and I already spoke to her. So she didn't have to be downtrodden. She didn't have to be, you know, having her head down and grabbing the sticks and that. She could have known if she would have had her vessel ready and prepared to receive what God had for her. She could have had the hope. She could have told her son, hey, God will provide for us. Just as he provided in the wilderness when he brought us out of Egypt, God will provide for us again. The next scripture we're going to look at <clears throat> is another very common scripture. It's about the Samaritan woman in John 4, verse 7 through 19. John 4, verses 7 through 19. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the sea to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So you see, you can't drink from living water and get your vessel full until you divorce yourself from the things of this world. See, there's going to be many things that are going to buy for our attention. There's, and, and it doesn't mean that they're sinful. Doesn't mean that they're sinful at all, but the world's going to try to fill up your time. Your time's going to get filled up one way or another in different activities. You know, we've got our everyday household chores. We've got those things to do. We've, we've got a job that we've got to go to, and we've got to do that. Then, we, then you come home, and then you've got the kids, and then you got to help them with homework. you got to make sure they're fed. And, you know, I mean, all these things keep stacking up. Maybe you got a hobby, and so then you're putting your time into your hobby, and then you got your kids, and they've got sports and they've got band and they've got all these different things and so we've got all these different things that are vying for our time and before we know it we do just kind of like the Shunammite woman and we do like the Samaritan woman we continue to go about in our daily work and things like that with empty vessels and keep getting things that are temporary to try to fill our vessel up but everything that we get no matter whether it's goods no matter what it's clothing no matter whether it's a house no matter whether it's a car no matter what it is no matter what we do whatever activity whatever thing we grab from the world it doesn't it doesn't fill us up and how can we know that we have an empty vessel you know you can notice it by the way that you treat one another by how you speak to your wife, how you speak to your children. You know what I mean? You can tell when you don't, you're not full of the Holy Ghost because what you're going to have is the opposite. When your vessel's not filled full of Him, you're not going to have love. You're not going to have joy. You're not going to have peace. You're not going to have a sound mind. You're going to worry about things. You're going to worry about the little things that God said. He said, don't worry about what clothing or what you're going to eat or what raiment you're going to wear. I'm going to provide all these things. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and I will, and his righteousness, and I will add all these things unto you. You see, you notice that she didn't know where to worship. Her fathers worshipped, and the Jews worshipped here, but she hadn't determined in her heart where she was going to worship. She hadn't set up her place of altar. 
You know, she wasn't going to the mountains to worship. She wasn't trying to go to Jerusalem to go to the temple to find a way to worship. She wasn't trying to force her way in. She just was continually going about her daily business. Did she know of him? Because if you look later on, she says... Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such work to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So she knew. She maybe as a child, maybe she knew the stories of the Bible. And she had them there. And she's like, when he comes, then I can worship. Then I'll decide where I'm going to worship. I'll decide how my household's going to be. But until then, I'm just going to go about my business. I'm going to continue. And she went about the sixth hour of the day, which would have been a hot day during the sun because she would have been shunned by her own people. She couldn't even go with her own people to go get water in the cool of the day. So we've got the Shunammite woman who just gave up all hope. We got the Samaritan woman who did not know where to worship. Now we've got Elijah. You see, the world can wear us out. There's two ways our vessel can, can become empty. One is the things of this world wear on us, and then our vessels become empty. And when our vessels become empty and we're not full, we can't be that ri- li- river of living water to flow into other people and to make a difference. John 4, I already read that. You see, we have to sometimes go back to our roots to remember the promises of God. Like I said, she probably was taught this as a child. But the third way, believe it or not, can be being zealous for God. Being zealous for God doesn't mean that we take time to have fellowship with him and worship him and get filled So we're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 10. First Kings 19, verses 9 through 10. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place, and behold... The word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? (coughs) Excuse me. So he said, I have been very zealous. Excuse me. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. With the sword, I am, I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. See, Elijah's vessel became empty, being zealous for Lord, the Lord God of hosts. See, we have to be careful of this because we can shut ourselves off from the will of God. It wasn't the will of God for him to be in the cave. That's why he said, he said, what are you doing here, Elijah? You know, he shut himself off. He became hurt. The people hurt him. And so he became fearful. He started believing what people were saying more than what God was saying about him and how God was going to provide for him. I mean, he put him beside the, the, the river and he let him drink from the river until it was dried up. He let the raven come and he let him feed him. And so he's always provided for him, no matter whether it was drought or whatever was coming his way. He always provided for him. He didn't left him leave him standing up there on the mount when he was making the sacrifice and he poured all the water over over it he didn't leave him alone then and so but he got so busy doing things that he forgot to step away and to take that time to spend with God 
The other things that we can do, too, is instead of him looking to find the people of God and to have fellowship with the people of God, he shut himself away from the people of God. And that's what happens when our vessel becomes empty, when we're in church and we're working in church. But in 1 Kings 19 18, God says to him, Yet have I reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. He still has a people. God will always have a people. You just have to seek them out. Ask God to put those people in your lives. Because those are the people that are going to encourage you when your vessel is empty. They're the ones that are going to have their vessel full, and they're going to turn their vessel and pour into you. And then sometime it's going to be them. That's why it says that we are to weep with one another. We are to rejoice with one another. We're to do life together that way because when we're empty, they can help fill us up, and then we can turn around and fill them up. And when we do that, we have the river of living water in our lives to provide for us, but it provides for everybody, and we all become one as a body, and we become more powerful. But the devil wants to isolate us. He wants to isolate us by having us too busy by the things of this world, and he wants to isolate us by us being just too busy in the church to where we only do things. And I know this, and I know this for a fact because I've lived it. I've lived it. I was so zealous for God, and it was when I was back here, and I was at First UPC, when I was here the first time, I started off and we started a van ministry. And when we started the van ministry, I didn't plan on starting a van ministry. But Brother McLean was very wise and they were taking turns, the different ministers driving people home. He came to me the one day. He said, I'm tired. It's my time to take them home. If you'll just ride with Brother Hudson, Brother Hudson knows the city. He'll tell you where to go. Just please take them home. So two weeks in a row that happened. And so then before long, guess who's doing the van ministry? I'm doing the van ministry. So then there's, we, we had about seven people at first. Then it went down to one person, and I was praying. I said, Lord, it's, it's, you know, I, I'll drive just for one, but please send some others. I turned my head like this. I turned back around, and there's this teenager girl up the, our window, knocked on the window. She says, can I come to church? I said, you got to get permission from your family. She goes around the corner, comes back with seven other kids. And so from there, it went from seven, it went to 40. And we baptized whole families in the name of Jesus. And the thing is, is I had to get up early to go get all the kids, bring them there. They had to sit there while I was in choir practice. Me and my wife were in choir practice. So we would sing, we would go, we would have Sunday school, we would have church. And then we'd have to drive every all the kids back and then come back and by the time we come back all the families were already done eating they had already got done fellowshipping and they went home and so we're out there on an island by ourselves and so i am being zealous in the word of god i'm you know but the problem was the only time i was studying the word of god was when i was preparing my lessons for the kids so my vessel was becoming empty and then all of a sudden something happened it, we had an event there, it was a festival, and when we had the festival, we told the kids, we can't come get you tonight for this. But one of the kids walked in from the neighborhood, and he did something, and then all of a sudden a family from the church came to Brother McLean, they're like, we got to shut down this van ministry, we got to we gotta, we gotta stop this, and Brother McLean's like, no, do you not understand, this kid was not from their ministry, he came in from the neighborhood. But this is why the church is being blessed is because we are giving to the poor because we are going and getting these kids. But I became discouraged. My vessel was empty. And so guess what I started to do? I became Elijah. I started to shut myself into my own cave. Did I backslide? No. But... As God said to Elijah, what are you doing in the cave? This is not where you're supposed to be. This is not what you're supposed to be doing. But that's the danger of an empty vessel. When you have an empty vessel, you can't pour out into others. And then the ministry that God has for you and the effect that you could have, you can't have because you have an empty vessel. As I said before, there's two ways that our vessel can become empty. We marry ourselves to too many things in this world, and we can become zealous for the Lord. 
The reason why our vessels become empty is we forgot one of the Ten Commandments. We forgot the Fourth Commandment to keep the Sabbath and to keep it holy. But we're going to talk about that. You see, we need to establish this year as the year of the Jubilee. See, I believe this church has great things ahead of it. But we got to do like the Jews do on their calendar. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we have to keep Saturday. That's not what I'm meaning by keeping the Sabbath. I'll explain because Jesus has now become our rest. And so we're to enter into him and I'll explain. The Hebrew calendar is based off of the number seven, the number of perfection. So we know God worked for six days and on the seventh day he rested. See, this was a time set aside for rest and to refocus on the Lord through worship and through fellowship. Let's look at Exodus 20, verses 8 through 10. And you'll see where I'm going with this here in a second. We have all got to decide when our Sabbath is going to be as a household. See, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cow, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He blessed it. By keeping the Sabbath, we receive our blessings. By keeping the Sabbath, our vessel gets filled full because there's blessings. You, you, wait until you see the Sabbath of the seven years, what God does. Now, as I was talking about, I'm not talking about Saturday. Let's go to Hebrews 4, 1 through 10. Because I studied this out one time. It's like, why don't we have church on Saturdays? Why do we have it on Sundays? And, you know, why don't we keep the Sabbath? You know, so I dug in a long time ago and I dug through these scriptures because I wanted to know. (coughs) Therefore, since a promise remains, Hebrews 4, 1 through 10. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So hearing the word of God and not applying it to our lives, we don't get to enter into that rest. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today after such a long time as it has been said, Today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So you can keep it daily, but how do you cease from your work? It's by having purpose in your work every single day, what God desires for you to do in your work. If you wake up in the morning and you just get ready and you get dressed, you're just like the Shunammite woman. You're going into your day without the leading and guiding of God and what he desires for you and what he desires for you to do in your day. I don't know how many times it feels like you just toil and you just work and you just do all these things and you just never seem to get to an end of it. 
But then on the days when you pray, it seems like things go smoother. God orders your footsteps. God puts people in your place, and you get to minister unto people. And when you get to minister to people, that's the amazing thing that I have found. When I need something, and I start ministering to somebody else, and I forget about myself because I hate to say it, I am self-centered. And without God, I am self-centered, I am self-serving, I serve my family, and my family comes first because that's my flesh. But when I serve other people and I start doing the will of God, the Holy Ghost comes over me in a way that you can't explain. This power and then just the Word of God just starts flowing through you and you begin to minister to somebody and then... Then you've made, I've, I've laid hands upon people and said, can I pray for you? And grab their hands and begin to pray. And I just feel the power of God flow in that place. And my vessel gets filled full because I'm not just going about my daily routine. I'm fulfilling the purpose God has for me. And I'm entering, I'm ceasing from my work and I'm entering into his work. And there's where I find my rest. How can we fail to enter into his rest? We can be hearers of the word and not doers of the word. Verse 6, be disobedient to God's word. And verse 10 talks about we must cease from our works. Like I said, I'm not talking about Saturday. I'm talking about every day establishing the Sabbath for our lives. Romans 14 is the next scripture. Romans 14, verses 5 through 8. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. He who eat does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. So he's saying, so each and every one of us has to decide how we're going to enter into our Sabbath, our Sabbath rest. You've got to set aside time. Remember I said before, there was a time set aside for rest and to refocus on the Lord through worship and fellowship. Is it Sunday? Make it all Sunday, the whole day. Get the things of the world out of your house. Make it a day of fellowship with God, fellowship with God's people, and fellowship with your family to rest. You know, I think it's kind of neat. I'm going to research how they prepare for the Sabbath. They prepare the night before, and they cook everything, and they have everything ready so they don't have to cook. All they have to do is just grab the things and be present with one another. Be present with one another. It would strengthen our families. It would strengthen us. Other thing, too, is you've got to get that quiet time. Even Jesus, when he was going about ministering and he was healing people, it said he separated himself unto the mountain to go pray, to have that fellowship, to have that time away. Many people are getting ready to go on the 21-day Daniel's fast, and I think it's wonderful. And guess what they're doing? They're instituting a corporate Sabbath. They shed away all social media. They don't watch TV. They don't pick up magazines. They, they, they don't do those things. They slowly but surely weed out the food. And they get rid of the food until at the end all you're doing is drinking water for maybe three days. So on that 21-day fast, so they cease working for the world and focus on God. They seek God's purpose for their life. They usually end it with a corporate worship and fellowship. They're instituting a Sabbath. But my question is, that's great for 21 days. What about the other 365 days of the year? You know what I'm saying? You got and you filled and you felt the power. And usually those services are wonderful. You could bring anybody up there and they can be healed. But what about preparing our vessels for the Sabbath every single day so we can pour into other people. If we do that this year and we institute the Sabbath in our lives, we will see this church grow. Now, the second 
one is I would like to venture to say we are all unsuccessful because we come to the Bible study and Sunday worship with empty vessels. Sunday worship is really not a time, or our Wednesday Bible study is not a time really to get your vessel filled. Your vessel should be full so it can continue to be full. So when we have people that don't know God, that we can minister unto them. What are the reasons, like I said, like the Samaritan woman, we got too many things that are bogging us up from the world. Like Elijah, we have become too busy and zealous with God's work to where we have forgotten to spend time with God. These two things will cause empty vessels and cause us to lose our rest. If we want to be successful in this new year, we must reinstitute the Sabbath into our life daily, as I was just talking about. Other thing, principles of the Sabbath are the Sabbath year. The second one. Every seven years, no sowing or reaping could be done. You see, God blessed the sixth year with a double portion of blessings because they kept the Sabbath year to honor God. And so as you notice, all creation needs rest. Even the fields need rest in order for them to produce what they are to produce. So on the sixth year, he gives you a double portion portion to carry you through that not only the seventh year but also the eighth year also because we honor God and we honor God by resting in him and doing that Sabbath rest the Jubilee which is what we're going to talk about next time is instituted at the end of seven Sabbath years so seven times seven and it's 40 Nine. So on the 50th year, they have the year of Jubilee where they don't not supposed to work at all. So God blesses them. And the, the funny thing is, is I was researching it. They never got to that. They maybe kept the seventh day and kept it holy for a period of time. They kept for a period of time the seventh year to rest the land. But it said that they never kept the Jubilee because they were so disobedient to God that they were led out into captivity. So they never got to fulfill the blessing of the Jubilee. Read about it before we we go to next week. It's Leviticus 25. Read chapter 25, and it's called the Jubilee. And I'm going to read that scripture, and then we're going to close. I think I did pretty good. I kept it on time. Chapter 25. I'm going to read 8 and 9 just to give a segue into it. And you shall count seven Sabbaths of years for yourself, seven times seven years. And the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be to you 49 years. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. You shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land to all of its inhabitants. See, the Sabbath is about freedom. It's about freedom that we obtain in Christ to where we don't have to toil anymore without any purpose. We can have purpose, and we can have purpose for our lives on a daily basis. Like I said, be praying and seeking God that he will help you to keep the Sabbath for your family this year. Let's pray. Any prayer requests as we close?